Hi everyone, this is Peter with the Federated Learning Team at Google. I'm a researcher and I'm very excited to tell you about some of the recent advances and open problems in federated learning. But before I jump into the core of my talk, uh, let me present what federated learning is. So federated learning is a machine learning setting where multiple entities, we refer to them as clients, they collaborate in solving a machine learning problem. They do so under the coordination of a central service provider, and each client's raw data is stored and kept locally. It's not exchanged, and it's not transferred or sent to other users or the central service provider. Instead, only focused minimal updates that are intended for the immediate aggregation are used to achieve the learning objective. And we're going to try to be a bit more precise about what we mean by immediate aggregation and focused updates in a bit in this talk. So let's take a look at one concrete example of federated learning. This is known as the cross-device federated learning. This is a setting where the entities are phones or tablets or computers. So we have many millions of them, possibly even billions. And the service provider wants to train a model that's going to then deploy on other devices. One way of doing so is we start with an initial model. This is shown as the cyan parallelogram on this slide. This is sent to the device by the service provider. The device uses its local data to update the model via some computation. And then we get that green update, which is sent back to the server. And the server receives all the updates aggregates them to get a newer model. And then we can compute metrics on this new model. If we like the metrics, we stop the process. If we don't like the metrics, we repeat the process over and over. Now, this is very general. One way of doing it is using the federated averaging algorithm. Under the federated averaging algorithm, on device, that computation I talked about is running a number of stochastic gradient descent steps. So you get the model and you update it via SGD by performing a number of steps with a certain learning rate. And then on the server, once the server gets all the updates from the clients participating in a particular round, it computes simply just the average of these updates. And that's how you get the improved combined model, which could be improved further in later rounds. Now, for this talk, I would like to focus on some of the recent open problems in this space. This is a very rich topic. And recently, we put up a paper on archive. It's called Advances and Open Problems in Federated Learning. I strongly encourage you to check it out. It has 58 authors from 25 institutions. It's a bit long, but it's very well partitioned. And I'm going to give you a very quick overview about this paper. So one front on which we can try to answer high impact open questions is how do we improve the efficiency and effectiveness of federated learning? For instance, how do we actually try to tackle new problems in machine learning, unsupervised learning or semi-supervised learning, where you know, we don't have many labels? How do we do reinforcement learning? How do we make the models smaller so that we can fit them on devices and we don't have to consume back and forth a lot of bandwidth in order to share with the service provider or the clients? How do we reduce wall clock time using improved adaptive algorithms, Adagrad and Adam, and more interesting algorithms for the problems we're looking at? One of the biggest challenges in this space is how do we do machine learning debugging when the service provider can never have access to the data? Those are all very interesting questions. Another front that has a lot of open questions is robustness to attacks and failures. Because federated learning is a distributed setting of machine learning, you can imagine that sometimes the data is faulty, or there are bugs, or perhaps the devices have been compromised by a malicious adversary. And so how do we ensure that while we're training the model, we're still keeping and maintaining the quality of the model on the main task and also on any uh, particular task? And Figuring out defenses that are robust to all sorts of attacks during inference time or during training time 
remains an open problem in this space. A third rich space of open problems is fairness and bias. Here, we are trying to tackle questions around how do we ensure that our model is not only representative of the majority of clients and devices, but also of any minorities we have in the population? How do we make sure the training data that is on device, which we never touch or see, that's the whole premise of federated learning, is not biased? The labels are rich and they cover all the space. They're not biased towards one class or the other. How do we train the model to perform well for everybody and for all tasks? And so this is a big open question. Now, for this talk, I would like to focus on privacy. And so much of the remainder of the talk is going to be about some of the recent advances and the open problems and challenges in private federated learning. But before we answer this question, we have to look at what we mean by privacy. So because federated learning has many different actors and players. There's the clients that are participating in the training, the server that's orchestrating the training, the engineer that has requested the model from the server, and there are the final devices that receive the model where it's deployed and used for inference. So many different actors and players. So it's important to always ask what private information might each one of these actors have access to, and that's really where we give rise to multiple threat models, which is a nuanced privacy in depth analysis. Now, I would like you to know that federated learning, at least the way we use it at Google, already builds a lot of privacy protections. For instance, we don't send the raw data. We only send the minimal focused updates, such as these model updates, which we talked about a bit ago. And when we take the updates, we combine them immediately and we delete them. So these updates are actually ephemeral. And we make sure that all the communication is encrypted end to end. And whenever we share with the engineer, we try to make sure that the engineer only sees things in aggregate. The engineer would not see any individual uh, updates from clients that are participating. So there's already a lot of privacy protections, but certainly this is not enough for giving strong guarantees. In order to give these strong guarantees, we need to look at a suite of complementary technologies that we have built. This includes modern encryption techniques, secure multi-party computation to do secure aggregation and shuffling, which I will be touching on in a bit, secure enclaves and trusted execution environments, and a variety of differential privacy technologies, including model auditing techniques these are empirical methods that would give us idea whether or not the model has overfitted to anybody's data, whether it has memorized some unique training examples. Now, again, this is a very rich space. It's all impossible to cover this in 15 minutes. So I would like to mostly focus on differential privacy for the rest of my talk. Now, what is differential privacy? Differential privacy is the statistical science of trying to learn as much as possible about a group or a population while learning as little as possible about any particular individual in this population or group. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of differential privacy and present the mathematical formulation. There are other talks in this conference on differential privacy that I encourage you to take a look at in order to better understand. But I can tell you how we will uh, do differential privacy in our systems, which is even more informative. So remember, we had this federated averaging algorithm where we said we do a number of SGD steps on device, and then we average the updates on the server. So one way of doing differential privacy, of applying it to federated learning, is if we trust the server, we can do the following. This is called central differentially private algorithms, or a centrally differentially private federated average, because we trust the server here. So what we do is we make sure that the users, they take the model update, and they do a clipping process on it that uh, restricts the L2 norm of this vector that's representing the model update. This essentially limits the contribution of the user. And all the participants in the round send their clipped model updates to the server. So their contributions 
have been limited. Each one of the contributions has been clipped and limited. They cannot send arbitrarily large contributions because of the norm projection process. And then the server aggregates these clipped updates and adds Gaussian noise. We can prove that the combination of clipping on the clients and Gaussian noise addition on the server achieves differential privacy. Now, the science of how do we track the privacy budget and how to report and do the privacy analysis, that's a bit complex and I'll touch on it towards the end of the talk. Another way of doing this is if we do not trust the server, we could let the users clip and add noise locally on their uh, devices. So you take the update, you clip it, you add noise, and then the server would only see the clipped and noisy updates from the participating clients. Now, obviously, this is much better for privacy because it does not require trusting that the server is going to add noise. But as you can imagine, this ends up adding too much noise to the result. And there are some fundamental results in the literature of differential privacy that show that it's almost impossible to train while maintaining accuracy under this model of privacy. So these are the two models. One is local differential privacy and one is central differential privacy. And in one of the recent works, we looked at how can we combine the best of both worlds. And this approach requires to anonymize or shuffle the updates that are incoming from users. So we would still clip on device. And now instead of sending the clipped updates directly to the server, we would shuffle them all together. And the server would only see shuffled or anonymized, if you want, clipped updates. And this model, in some sense, combines the best of both worlds because you're doing the clipping and noising on device, and then you're shuffling it. It turns out that you can preserve accuracy for federated learning, so you can still train high quality models. And we show exactly the trade off between accuracy, privacy, and communication in a recent work that's on archive. I encourage you to look at this paper with a bunch of great collaborators from UCLA, where we study the shuffled model of federated learning for the first time. Now, shuffling is great as I described it, but there are a lot of challenges when computing the privacy budget and doing the analysis. For instance, in, differential, in federated learning, we typically do not know the size of the population. We can have some guess or estimate, we don't know it exactly. And clients tend to be online for a while, but then they drop out and they don't have to be available all the time. This is the way the system is designed. So for privacy purposes, we need to try to design algorithms that are robust to these variations. And so what we are looking for is a mechanism to enforce differential privacy such that it gets good privacy accuracy trade-offs, and it's robust to these choices of nature where devices can be online and offline you know, at any point in time where they can drop out, they don't have to continue until the whole thing is completed. And we want also these mechanisms and these procedures to have clean ways to compute the final privacy budget in order to do this holistic privacy analysis. And in fact, this is the topic of a very recent paper we put up on archive. It's called Privacy Amplification Via Random Check-ins with a bunch of great collaborators from Google. In a nutshell, in this paper, what we propose and what we achieve is a new way of doing differential privacy in federated learning. In fact, we give the option for clients to decide whether or not they want to participate by flipping a random coin and when they want to participate. So they would randomize their choice of participation or not, and they would randomize when they would participate. And we showed that this achieves the state-of-the-art metrics, and it leads to a very good way of doing the privacy analysis holistically in federated learning. If you want to learn more, Borja Bali, one of the co-authors of this paper, is going to give a talk during this conference. With this, I'm going to stop. I'm going to thank you for attending my talk. Please let me know if you have any questions. And please check out TensorFlow Federated. This is a TensorFlow library that allows you to train machine learning models with privacy, with DP, different flavors of DP, and in a federated setting. Thanks so much.